Well, if you get your Bibles out and uh, turn to the book of Ephesians, we are going to be in chapter 3 today. And the title of the sermon is The Mystery of the Ages. You know, I don't spend a lot of time titling things. You know, maybe I should. Preachers, you know, do that sometimes and it you know, has an exciting sort of... Uh, get your interest peaked in a little bit, but the truth is, is as ominous or powerful as the title sounds to this, what's preached in this chapter of Scripture lives up to the title of this message. We are going to be talking about what the mystery of the ages is. Many people think they know what that means, some sort of riches or some sort of secret elixir to life. You know, people have quested for or talk about. Obviously, in our modern time, we look to science and and we look to other places for these sort of these sort of enlightenments. But the truth is, the mystery of the ages was established in the beginning of time. It hasn't played out to end up being this. God and His sovereign providence made this to be from the beginning. So, if we'll turn to Ephesians chapter three, verse one. It says, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am very least of all the saints, This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is plain or what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access and confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend all the saints what is the breadth and and length and the height and the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly than we should even ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Lord, I know we've prayed several times, but the truth is, God, without your spirit, your word does not go forth. God, your, it's your spirit working uh, with the, the written word of God, Lord. I just pray that you would anoint your words to fall on good ground. And God, that deaf ears would hear and blind eyes would see the truth of the gospel of grace that you've given us. Lord, I, think it, I pray it wouldn't be lost on us as a room full of Gentiles that we were asked and, and offered an opportunity to partake with the God of Israel and his people. Not just in the present age, but for all eternity. So, Spirit of God, be with us. Lord, as we, as we preach about the Son of God. Lord, in honor of God the Father, Lord, and the triune God, Lord, I pray that you would just conform us to the image of Christ in these next few moments, God, and Lord, that we would be able to rightly represent you in the truth which you saved us with and which we are called to proclaim to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. 
the mystery of the ages. You know, every time I read a text like that, when I'm preaching to this group of people, I think, man, maybe I should have broke this chapter down in two or three sections. But the truth is, we got a lot of stuff to get to over the year you're here. And so I, I urge you to dig into these chapters of Scripture as God enlightens your heart under the preached word of God that you would go search these things out for yourself and be edified as God speaks to you directly through his word. The, the gospel is for every man, and the Bible is for every man, and man and woman and child. It's the spirit that enlightens us to perceive the truth of God's word. In fact, it's the wisdom of men sometimes that causes us to be confused about these things. We would rather look to the wisdom of man. And when God says, listen, if you don't come to me like a child, you don't have any part with me. Children are trusting. Children are believing until we take that away from them, right? Children don't know how to be scared. They don't know how to do... They, they learn these things from us. We've got to come to God like little children who believe that their father is good. And they believe their father is able so over the past few weeks, we've discussed what Paul has said here in other places than the New Testament. We've discussed the immeasurable riches of the grace of Christ Jesus our Lord. These eternal riches of the gospel were secured for us by our hero and Savior, Jesus Christ. In regeneration, as we were made new beings in Christ, leaving our past behind. <coughs> In a very broad way, Paul has painted a picture of grace and how that grace interacts with humanity throughout the ages. This is what he did in chapter 2. If you guys will remember, he kind of forensically dissects what grace is. And so in the beginning of chapter 2, we talked about our need for grace. We, ha we, we can never get past that or get around that. We can never forget about the neediness how dead we were in sin and trespass, how helpless and hopeless we were, how our good deeds or good works or good family name had nothing to do with us inheriting the gift of grace that comes from God through Christ alone. So we, we, we've kind of dissected what the, the, the need for grace was, which was our, our dead in sin and our, and our trespass. And then we talked about what the means of grace were. The means of grace, which was a sinless Savior who came to earth and took on flesh and lived a perfect life and died for us, laid his life down, and by his own power, with, with no, no more effort than it takes you to blink your eye, he raised it up again. And this is not only the means by which we're saved, but this is the only means by which we could have been saved. It's not that Jesus did something and that we, you know, it was the only way we were saved. There was no other way. There was no other plan and there was no other possibility of a plan. And then finally we talked about the eternal purpose of grace. And what did we say the eternal purpose of grace was? Or what did Paul communicate to us? That God went to these great lengths for us to be part of the family of God. And when we see the fact that we didn't deserve it, chapter 2 makes great pains to explain that to us. You were dead in sin and trespass. Listen, you're saved by grace through Christ, nothing of yourself, that no man should boast. As we see the fact that it was so unearned and so undeserved, and we see that God in His holiness and His goodness sent His Son down to die for us, then we see this invitation to be part of his family as the greatest honor of our lives. Over the past few weeks, we've discussed what Paul would say in other places. And he says here, we focused on what the immeasurable riches of that which is Christ Jesus. So remember in chapter 1, in sort of a, a prayer, Paul asks God to open the eyes of of the people under the sound of his voice's heart. This sort of play on words. Listen, open the eyes of their heart because we can't even perceive our spiritual deadness apart from the Spirit drawing us in, opening our eyes. In preparation for what we're about to be told, like I just said, the need for grace. 
the means of grace and the way our grace is secured through Christ alone. Not only the death and resurrection of Christ, but the perfect life of Christ. In Ephesians 2, 18 through 22, it says, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, as we read this last week. So that when you are no longer strangers and aliens, but now you are fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. we got to remember that because there's a lot of other versions of Christianity out there that aren't built on the, the prophets, the, the apostles' witness testimony of the gospel. But through Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple for the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We're not going to talk a lot about this, but in chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see a description beautifully made of the Trinity. The function of God the Father, the function of Christ the Son, and the function of God the Holy Spirit, working together in unity as one God in three persons. So in chapter 2, we saw the need for grace, the means of grace, and the eternal purpose of grace. And likewise, in chapter 3, we'll be looking at three additional things that were accomplished through the grace of God as He fulfills His eternal and sovereign purpose through the cross. So God's purpose in grace, the grace that comes from the gospel was, number one, to reveal his manifold wisdom to all the inhabitants of the universe. So in verse 10 of chapter 3 it says, So that the church, the manifold wisdom of God, might be now made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. What is he talking about? He's talking about, and the King James would say, principalities and spirits of the air, or the ruler of this age. He's talking about the, the rulers that are at work in this world. The devil, spirits of darkness, things that prey on the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the ever tricky and sneaky pride of life. The things that this world looks towards. And it's saying through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is going to be displayed to those powers and those authorities. Number two. The grace of the gospel, God's purpose and the grace in the gospel was, was given to us to reveal the immeasurable and unsearchable riches of Christ, His one and only begotten Son. In verse 8, it says, To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then finally, number three, to reveal the mystery of all the ages. And verse 9 says, To bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery of ages for all ages in God who created all things. And when we find out what this mystery is, which we've already talked about, so it's not some big reveal, you understand that the gospel and the cross was always God's plan. Predetermined from the beginning. The cross is not a reaction to something that God didn't foresee. God didn't, God didn't go, well, that plan didn't work. I've got to figure things out and make a way for these guys. He knew the fall would happen. He knew that men would need a Savior. And listen, in the book of Ephesians, it shows that God used these things that seemed foolish and wicked and flawed to ultimately, in the end, showcase... <coughs> His wisdom, His power, and His sovereignty. The God of Israel is not only the one and true God, but He is the God over all people, of all nations, in all periods, past, present, and future. He is the great I Am. He is superlative. The God of the past, the future, and the present. He always has been. He always will be. He wasn't the God of Israel who invited some Gentiles to come in. 
It was his plan all along to raise up a people of his own, set them apart for the glory of God, to establish his word through the prophets, to raise up the Messiah from that people, and then to invite all people of all times to partake in the eternal riches of Christ. You were not an afterthought to God. You were someone that God had in mind when his son went to the cross. God had you in mind when, when Moses abandoned the riches of Egypt. When it talks about God's people in the eternal sense, we are talking about Christians, not Jews. Jews are God's special people, but we have been grafted into that to make up the eternal family of God as we discussed last week. The mystery of the ages is found in verse 6 of this text. It says, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This would have been great news to the Gentiles. And it doesn't seem that shocking and staggering to us because we weren't raised in first century Israel where Jews did not mix with Gentiles. And when the Jew G Gentiles were the oppressive people that were there, Controlling them and ruling them. And Gentiles knew how the Jews felt about them. Not just the Romans. Gentiles in general. That's why the Samaritan lady was so shocked when, when not only did Jesus talk to her, but he asked her for a drink of water. And when Jesus told her that he was the long-awaited Messiah, her reaction wasn't, well, great, that's good for me. Her thoughts were, for God's people, but he made her understand that it was for all people of all time. Isn't it interesting that the first person Christ revealed his lordship to the earth was a Gentile woman? God takes the foolish things, the weak things, the small things, the broken things. Listen, if you ain't small, weak, and broken, it's going to be hard for you. Listen, humble thyself or be humbled in the sight of the Lord. But for those of us who are in Christ, this is good news. For the Gentiles, this is great news, the best news. And this, this Paul says, this is the mystery of all the ages. What the apostles didn't know, what, the, what Moses didn't know. They didn't understand that the Messiah was not only going to be the God of, of Israel and reign and rule from there forever, but he was calling all people from all times, of all shapes, sizes, ethnicities, to be part of the family of God, every tribe and every nation. The God of Israel is God of all. Through the power of the gospel and the power of the cross. So Israel, this nation blessed by God, separated unto themselves for God's purposes, God's holy people. And now we, the Gentiles, are included in the promises that God made to Israel. What's interesting about that is we are not subject to the same scrutiny that Israel was, but we are inheritors of the same promise of Israel. To be part of a promised land and a chosen people. All these things are now available to Gentiles, but the truth is now available to Jews as well. Because even the, the most legalistic, thoughtful Torah reciting Jewish Pharisee could not bear up under the burden of the law himself. So although he did these things through the Jews in history past, his ultimate purpose was the, the salvation of Jews and Gentiles to bring unto himself a group of people that would become one group of people who would hear the voice of one shepherd and be one group of sheep. In John 10, 14, it says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Then talking about us, he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold and I must also bring them in. And they too will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life and I take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my father. 
You guys ever heard the uh, the parable of the men working in the field? Where they go and hire someone for uh, one denarius to come work in the field? This The Jews and the Gentiles both being brought in, this is the, 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 the point of this parable. Remember what we talked about last time we were together. That God is calling those who are near, the Jews, and those who are far off, us. And people who are religious and feel like maybe they've earned something don't care too much for that. Before I I get into the text, I can tell you from personal experience, and I I don't say this arrogantly, but I have had experiences with people before who have been less than happy that God has blessed me or given me a ministry. Because they think, I've been working so hard my whole life as a Christian, and then this guy who squandered his whole life now all, the, all of a sudden has this opportunity to forward the gospel in a platform. And it makes them vindictive or angry. You know what it exposes? It exposes that their purpose in working in the field is not the same as mine. If the end goal is to see sinners saved and for Christ to be glorified, then there really is any competition. And when we see a soul that should be lost like mine, desperately should be lost... And we see that God takes some broken, just wadded up piece of garbage and raises it up for his glory. We should, be, we, we should be encouraged that that's the God we serve. It's so easy for us, even for me. We, we come from these extreme backgrounds and God does. But so quickly we fall into the thing where we start feeling like we've been, we've been doing good for a while. We start kind of transplanting the the weight of responsibility of our salvation on ourself. I mean, look at him. You know, if you just do it like me, be a little more faithful like I am. And the Jews had this sort of mentality towards the Gentiles. Even, even years and years before, look at Jonah. As he was sent out to the Ninevites, he did not want to see them saved. And in the parable in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus explains this. He said, listen, there was a man who, who came to, to a group of people and said, listen, come and work in my field and I'll pay you a denarius. Very, very generous wage to work for one day in a field. You know, some estimates say that maybe that was a, you know, a week salary. And so they go and they work in the field. They're happy to do it, right? This guy's paying way above what anyone else pays. So they go out there and work, but there was more work to be done. So he finds another group of people later and he says, listen, I'll pay you a denarius. Go work in the field. And then at the middle of the day, he goes and he finds some of us, right? And he says, hey, listen, still more work to do. I'll pay you a denarius. Go work in the field. And even at the end of the day, when the day is almost done, he says, there's still work to do. I'll give you a whole denarius if you'll go work in the field. And at the end, they all line up to get paid. And he starts paying them. And the people who have been working all day think, well, surely if he's going to pay these guys a denarius, he's going to pay us a lot more, right? They forgot about the fact that it was a generous wage to start with. And they took their eyes off that fact, and now they're bitter at the person who got the same reward. And listen, we get the same reward. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone, and no man has a right to boast. And so we can sneer and kind of look at the Jews and say, man, they sure were judgmental. But it happened six months into this program when you've been here living good for a while and all of a sudden you're the most spiritual dude on the campus. And that new guy just can't seem to get it together. And I wish they'd move him to another room. Or we do that in our Christian walk after a guy like me been walking with God for 10 years. And I start thinking that maybe the reason my life is going the way it is is because I know God's blessed me, but I'm, I've done a lot of right things in a row. <laughs> and how quickly we're humbled. But to be humbled by the riches that Christ has bestowed on us will make us live content lives. We'll get back to that. There is no Jew or Gentile that has ever been saved anywhere that wasn't saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. (laughs) This is the mystery of all ages. This is the immeasurable riches of Christ. 
that are not only stored up for God-fearing Jews, but also God-fearing pagans and Gentiles and business people and ex-drug addicts and prostitutes, people who squandered their whole life's potential, but because their spiritual eyes were open, call upon the name of the Lord and are saved unto the eternal riches of the same Savior. To be included in the promises of God that he made to the Jews is the greatest blessing we could ever hope for. On the flip side, the greatest tragedy in life is not understanding the value of these treasures that is Christ. Because not perceiving his value will cause you to misunderstand everything else. The reason why we can live lives like we did before, is because we didn't see Christ as enduringly valuable. Misunderstanding the value of something can cost you dearly. I have a, an uncle who's an electrician. It's a true story. And he would go over and he was helping a lady fix up her house. She was elderly on a fixed income. And so after work, he would go over and he was rewiring her entire house. She had the money to pay him, but she'd cook him a meal every now and then and she was so thankful and grateful. She was living in one room of her house because her old house got to the point where the electricity didn't work in various places in the house. So little by little, he, he made it where the electricity worked all through the house, ran safe wiring for it. She was so appreciative. She's like, I wish I could pay you something. But my husband, before he passed, we used to own a little you know, five and dime store. And there was a crate up there with some old stuff. Maybe you could go get some stuff out of there, you know, give to your kids or whatever. So he goes up in there in the attic opens a chest, and inside of it are unopened boxes of 1950s Topps baseball cards. So he goes down to her. He's an honest guy. He goes down to her and he says, listen, I don't think you know what you got up there. Or it's in the height of the collection, you know, collection craze back in the 90s. Things are worth thousands and thousands of dollars. If you open them up and find the right card, it might be worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. But even just selling the unopened boxes by themselves, you're selling them for thousands of dollars, just the box with the, with the packs inside. And he was trying to explain to her what she had up there. And she couldn't get through her head that these little nickel packs of baseball cards with baseball players on them that her son used to put in the wheels of his bike to make it sound like a motorcycle was worth value. But because she didn't perceive the value that was actually in those cards. But because he was a good man, he did her a, a, a real big solid. He said, listen, I'll take a box of these as payment. Thank you. And if you would like, I'll sell the rest of these for you. She's like, do what you want. He went and sold them in a card show. He didn't like spend a bunch of time and he could have probably got more, but he got thousands of dollars and gave it to this lady. What was, the, what was the problem there with her? She didn't understand the value of those cards, but he did. If she had known, she probably would have sold them a long time ago. She didn't understand the value. And here's the reason we live lives like there is no God in Israel. is because we don't perceive the value of Christ. See, the greatest reward of your life is realizing that a God who is holy sent his son to die for you. And living your life like that's something common is the most horrific tragedy in history. Not just because you will be judged, because you will be judged but because you're missing out on a, an, a, on a windfall of security and peace that will endure for eternity. The Bible says we're only, we can only kind of look into these things. We're looking through our glasses very dim and very dirty. We have no idea just how valuable Christ is. But I, I think I got a glimpse of it. I think I've got a glimpse of it because when I realized who he was, my life changed. Not because I tried harder to do better, but because I was reborn and my eyes were opened. And that's what I want for you too. The person of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ are the most valuable resources in the universe. A God that is able to save us and who is willing to save us. 
Paul summarizes this in a very succinct manner in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel, that is. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on now which you stand, and which, you are, which by you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance also what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and this in, in accordance with the scriptures. <clears throat> so in the gospel, we as Gentiles are now partakers. Or partakers in something valuable. But here's the, the, the problem. And here's why most of us are outside of this inheritance. It's because, like I said before, we don't see the value of the inheritance. I don't want to give too many like examples, but I just want to press the point in a little bit. How many of you ever saw the movie Forrest Gump? And he, you know, gets a letter at one point with an apple on it. And he's like, you know, he knew that he had some sort of stocks, even though he didn't know what those were. And this company with a picture of an apple that he thought it was funny. And at some point he gets a letter. And he says, Mom, I don't think we're going to have to worry about money anymore. Right? He, at some point, he understood the value. We have a very important part of the Bible that talks about not understanding the value of an inheritance. And that's the story of Jacob and Esau. Someone who had the keys to the father's kingdom in his hands, who is the oldest son who had rightfully inherited all that his father Jacob had. And because he was someone who lived life by his stomach, <coughs> traded his inheritance for a bowl of soup. And it says he wept bitterly in regret. But there was no way to console him. There's no way that my words can paint a picture for you that makes you see the value of Christ. But I'm here to tell you, if you pray to God that he would open your spiritual eyes and you dig in this word like there's gold in here, you will find out who Christ is. See, many times we put our faith in a, a God we learned about in a worship song or a God we heard about from our grandma. And that may be the real God, but the truth is, is it's not your real God. The only way you're going to have faith in God is through the word of God. Because faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. If the Jesus that you serve isn't mighty to save, if it's not something that just blows your mind, then you're not looking deeply enough into who the person of Christ is. So in the gospel, we the Gentiles now see that we're partakers in the promise of God's people. And through the cross, we will inherit, in, I mean, God is saying this, immeasurable riches that are endless and eternal, which God has bestowed on Christ for what he did and, and on us as partakers and co-heirs with Christ based on the goodness of God. Nothing of ourselves, we play no part we are just the grateful benefactors of the blessing. So now we understand the revelation of the mystery of all ages. And we kind of maybe a little bit understand the riches that are Christ in the gospel. But how does this link together with what we talked about in the beginning? What is revealed? The riches of Christ, right? The mystery of all the ages and the wisdom of God. A wisdom that's going to make the scoffing world that pokes fun at the God of Israel, that makes fun of a God we believe in that created the world in six days, one day his wisdom will be revealed to all. So how do we get there? Well, 1 Corinthians 1 tells us. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, God speaking here, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one among you who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made, the foolishness, made foolishness the wisdom of the world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those of us who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. What is the offense of the cross? It is the foolishness of believing that God, apart from him, you are going to perish like a piece of grass in the noonday sun when science tells you otherwise. Surely God didn't set the stars in the sky. Some gases did that. Surely the complex organism that is the human being didn't come from God. We'll even debase our own minds and, and, and say things that are illogical to prove this fact. In what world does a single cell replicate itself over millions of years and become more and more and more intelligent? That is the opposite of what science teaches us. In fact, the opposite is true. But people are so desperate to escape the, the lordship of Christ that we will debase our own minds to the point where the Bible says at some point that we'll even be so debased that we won't even seek the affection of, of the opposite sex anymore. We'll be so debased that we'll worship creation rather than the creator. Listen, Christ crucified bringing you salvation is not the wisdom of the world. It is the wisdom of God. Look at your own life. Look at your life. Think about who you are. Those of you who are in Christ, when you first came here, were you ever annoyed that we didn't get down to the brass tacks of why you're a drug addict? Frustrated that we weren't telling you the, the, the psychological data from the latest discoveries and breakthroughs? In a system that has a 6% success rate. But they got coats. And they got degrees. I'm not beating people up that are educated. I'm in the process of further educating myself now. But listen, st staggering as it may seem, human wisdom is like a grain of sand in the vast sea of God's wisdom. And listen, to be a Christian, if you can't take him at his word, about his word, about everything his word says, then you are not proving God is a fool. You are a fool. And I'll boldly say that here. Because it's without this, without this we're dead. Without the foolishness of God coming to earth and dying on a cross, taking a curse for us, like Galatians says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus became a curse for you and for me. Yeah, it may be funny to those guys. It ain't funny to me because I'm not perishing. I'm one of those grateful ones as being saved by faith in Christ. Christ crucified is not wisdom of the world. It's the wisdom of God. To the world, it's not power. It's foolish and weak. But to those who are called, like chapter 1 says, and to those who have had the eyes of their heart open, it is divine wisdom. And it is the power of God. I won't back down from, about that from anything because without it, your life ain't going to change. I don't have anything for you but Christ and Him crucified. And evidence that God will take a dead thing and raise it to life. If that's what you really want. So why is the wisdom of God seen as foolishness to the world? We're getting close to the close. Well, it's pretty simple. It's because they don't know the, the answer to the mystery of the ages. And mainly because they don't see the immeasurable beauty and vast glory and eternal just majesty that is Jesus. Or put another way, they don't see God as holy and worthy. People who don't see God as holy ask questions like this. Why'd God have to send Jesus to die anyway? You ask that question because you don't understand the justice of a holy God that's been offended and wronged. 
Or you ask questions like this. Why is the punishment for rejecting Christ eternal torment? It's because you don't see the value of the sacrifice. You've got to see the value of who God is. Why didn't God just ignore justice in this case? Wouldn't it be more loving just to ignore the supposed justice His holiness is offended by? You don't see the value of God. You don't see God. Having faith in God in reality is having faith in the wisdom of God. The plan of God that's wiser than any other wisdom, than any human wisdom. To be saved and to follow God means first that you trust Him. Namely, about your life and salvation. But secondly, about your life in this world. People in the Bible lived radical lives according to the world. But it wasn't really radical. It's just that they believed God. And they believed they were living for a future city. To be saved and follow God means that you trust Him. You trust his wisdom. You trust the wisdom of the cross. You trust his wise and perfect plan for your life. You trust the wisdom and sovereignty of when and where and how you will die in this life. Jesus was obedient to the Father and coming to earth as a baby. How he lived his life. How he died in his resurrection. Because Jesus was obedient to God unto death. Because he understood the wisdom of God. Because he was exposed to those that that mystery right it wasn't a mystery to him he knows why he came to earth and that truth that is christ is the light of the world follow me for a second here because of this jesus was called the light of the world so we as his people or the church or the true family of god we also trust god's wisdom And we also live our lives according to the foolishness of the cross. We also trust Him for the direction our life's going to go. We also trust Him that He knows the day and the hour He has appointed us to depart from this world. And we trust Him with our life. And we trust Him with our money. And we trust Him with our kids because we know God is great. But God is also good. And we believe Him. And because of that, we are the light of the world. You're not the light of the world because things go your way. Or because you have answers. Or because you get predictive prophecy. You are light of the world because you will bear up under suffering for the glory of God because you believe him and that his wisdom is wise and his power is mighty despite what it looks like in the world we also trust God's wisdom in all these things and because of this we're the light of the world the salt of the earth Verse 8 says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentile the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring light to everyone the plan of the mystery that was hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was to be made known to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. And so Paul makes a personal plea. In light of all these things, don't lose heart. Remember where Paul's writing this letter from? He's in jail. And he's encouraging the church, don't lose heart. Yes, you're weak. And yes, we are, like he said in Romans, being killed all day long for the glory of God. But we believe God's wisdom. Paul was in prison. And in prison, Paul was a shining light. And his words were like salt. And his suffering was like light in a dark world. And it was encouragement to the believers of the church of Ephesus. Listen, how well you suffer and endure in this life... Here's another one, brothers. How well you endure suffering in this place says something about your gaze of the internal and immeasurable riches of Jesus. I can see it happen in you when it happens. I can see when the light comes on. Not because I have some spiritual insight, but just because it's plain as day. Something dead that comes to life. Not only in the life to come, but in this life. In this life. 
Listen, you're going to inherit the reward in the life to come. You've got to be salt and light in this life for the glory of God. You've got to trust God with your life. The ultimate power of God was manifest in the beginning. Listen, as he spoke the world into existence. Is this foolishness to you? Or is it the power of God? I'm asking a real question. Is the idea that God spoke the world into existence and created everything in six days, is that foolishness to you? Because some scientist tells you otherwise. Is it foolishness or is it the power of God? Listen, the ultimate and unparalleled power of God was displayed in history past as he took on flesh, lived a perfect life, fulfilled every prophecy, laid his life down, and with no, no trouble at all, picked it back up again for your sake and mine. Is that foolishness or is that the power of God? In this present age and throughout the ages, he's raised up wretches and hopeless and helpless lost sinners to be partakers in his coming kingdom. People like you and people like me, is this foolishness or is this the glory and power and wisdom of the sovereign God of the universe who knew where you would be in this week and this time period and he's worked all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Are you called according to his purpose? Or is his plan, his word, just foolishness to you or a fable or good stories or good morals or something you're trying to do to get by in this place? It's everything or it's nothing, brothers. The entire word of God, the revelation of Christ, in total is either foolishness or it's the power of God. The power of the one true sovereign God of the universe. And if you don't think about this and live for this and everything you say and do, and I'm not talking about being perfect, I'm talking about just being consumed, transformed, changed. If every aspect of your life is not consumed by this, if you're not paralyzed by the, the vast richness of the beauty of Christ, if you think any degree of this is foolishness, here's why. It's because you're a fool who's perishing. Listen, even in your failure and your falling, God says in your weakness he's strong. You still see Christ when you fall down. It's not about being perfect. It's about being changed. It's about realizing there's nothing in this life. Nothing as valuable as Christ. It's like Paul being able to say, listen, all things are lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. My Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and not be found in a righteousness of my own that comes from knowing the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. He goes on, this is Philippians chapter 3. He says, you know, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, but I also want to participate with him in his sufferings. Why? Because he understood to have one, you have to have the other. Christ took on flesh, suffered, died, laid his life down, picked it up. And not for your salvation, but he's calling you for the same thing. Listen, no one, no human, no angel, no demon, no devil will ever enter eternity without acknowledging the supreme, infinite, and sovereign wisdom of God. As Satan and his demons are cast into the lake of fire, as every atheist who ever scoffed at the word of God, as every academic who's ever laughed at God and said you're a fool for believing it, as every person that's ignored the beautiful, boundless riches of the blood of Jesus are cast into a lake of fire, they will acknowledge the wisdom of God. I say it another way many other places, but the truth is you acknowledge it now or you acknowledge it later. But if you acknowledge it now, it's power unto salvation. Five minutes and we'll be out of here. Everyone who ever shrugged, shrugged off the need for the cross and the power of the cross will be forced to acknowledge the supremacy of Christ as they prepare to endure much deserved wrath that will come from the Lamb of God. People ask, if God's so loving, why doesn't he ignore justice and not punish sinners? And the reason you ask this question is because you are an unjust sinner who don't understand good. 
But like in the, the chapter 1 says, you're a, a, a child of wrath by nature. Deserving of wrath. You're like an animal. Who only thinks of yourself. We understand justice sometimes. We, we, we talk about ju- we, we don't want justice. We want to pass by when it comes to the holiness of God. What if someone did something horrific to your daughter or your son? Hurt them. Killed them. Maimed them. And the judge said, well, I, think he, I don't think he meant to. <laughs> We're just going to let him go. What would you say? Now you, would, you would say, excuse me? You better do some justice for my kid or I'm going to take justice in my hands. I want justice. And guess what? Everything about God's being deserves justice. And here's the truth. God's not asking you to take that justice on yourself. He's not even asking you to to bear up under the wrath of God. All he's asking you to do is to surrender to the one who has for you. That's all he wants. All he wants you to do is acknowledge the beauty and immeasurable glory of the Son, his only begotten Son that he bestowed all things on for, who saw fit to bleed and die for you out of love for you. All he wants you to do is acknowledge him in his rightful place as king. And just do what's, what Paul says in Romans 12 is just the honorable thing to do. Just the basics of Christianity. Just offer your life up as a living sacrifice. It's not that much to ask. In light of what God's done for you. The final part of this, Paul expresses his his thoughts towards this church in a prayer as he's writing from prison. I'm just going to read this, give you a little commentary. We'll pray and you guys will be dismissed. Verse 14 says, listen, for this reason, all the stuff Paul just talked about. For this reason, for chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3's first half, for this reason... I will bow my knees to the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. We belong to God. Your life's on loan from Him. It ain't yours. You're in rebellion when you don't live your life unto God. That according to the riches of His glory that He may grant you to be strengthened with the power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted And grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints that is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We must, like Paul, have faith not only in the power of God, but in the wisdom of God. So that like him, we too can say all things are lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. And Then the word of God will give you faith and strength to endure all challenges for life. All the time being a church that is salt and light and acknowledging the wisdom of the Lord in this life as you live it by faith. As you live it by faith, out of what? Out of love for God. How can you see Christ and not love God when you understand who God is? See, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, but that's not the end of wisdom. Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians, there's deep a depth to wisdom. We see God for who he is. That's the beginning. But what the end result is, is an incomprehensible love that will never pass away. That Paul describes at the end of Romans 8. When he, he uses all sorts of adjectives and power words and extreme situations. And he can't even describe it. So he gives up at some point. He says, listen, uh, nothing Not even anything in creation can separate us from this love. Do you love God? Well, the real question is, do you know God? Because if you know him, you love him. You love him. 
because he, he only not only bled and died and gave his life for you, but he rose again and made a way for you to be a co-heir in Christ. Listen, the eternal mystery of life is finding ourselves in Christ and everything else coming a, a far, far, far second. And I say that all the time, but I want to reiterate one thing as I close here. You got to put your kids on the altar. You got to put your wife on the altar. You got to put your future on the altar. Amen. Truthfully. But listen, the things that God, that you give up to God that are bad, he's going to keep them. They're going to disappear in the fire. The things that are good, he's going to give them back to you by God's grace with a heart that can actually steward them, realizing that they belong to God. Your wife don't belong to you. She ain't your object. She ain't your possession. She's something that God has given you to steward, to serve, to love. Your children, they don't belong to you. They belong to God. Listen, you don't belong to you. You belong to God. And it's for love that he chose you. Lord, I thank you for this group of men and women, Lord. Lord, it is the highest honor of my life to proclaim your word to this group of people. Lord, as I travel and speak other places, God, I do so out of obedience and I enjoy it, Lord, the evangelistic side of it. But God, my heart is with this community of people, Lord, that you've entrusted me to steward. God, these aren't my people. These are your people. And God, I thank you for the grace that you've given me to to be a, a flawed but hopefully obedient under shepherd, Lord. Lord, I thank you for every man in this place, Lord, that just, just can't trust you enough to unclench their hands off the things they want to control. God, I pray that they would find that their wisdom is foolishness, God, and it's vastly and quickly and rapidly passing away. Lord, but if they would trust you, Lord, Lord, in your greatness, but also in your goodness, you're good, God. It's for freedom you set us free. It's to give us life and life more abundantly. Lord, I pray that we would see you for who you are so that we can learn to trust you. Lord, my prayer is that we would direct that attention to your word. And God, that we would understand what it truly means to walk in the spirit, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've made. Bless those who are suffering out there in the dark. In Jesus' name, amen.